Hello, uh, I want to welcome you to our uh, webinar on how taxes, risk, and fees affect retirement income. Uh, so starting off, Daniel, you're the tax attorney. Uh, can you really save money on taxes? Yeah, most of our clients were able to save over a million dollars on taxes wow. by working with us. Wow, okay, that's impressive. Uh, now, as far as risk goes, uh, my understanding is you really have to take risk in order to get a, a good return. Well, that's, that's actually a myth. A lot of people believe that you need to take more risk in order to get a good return. Uh, but sometimes the opposite is true. Sometimes taking less risk gives you a better, better return. And so it really depends on the situation. And well, we'll talk about that today as well. Okay. All right. And then fees are the third component. Uh, I mean, it seems like a lot of people pay right around 1%. Uh, that doesn't seem too bad. But what, what does a 1% fee mean? Well, a 1% fee can actually eat away 31% of your growth over time. So we'll talk about that as well. I mean, these three things, taxes, risk, and fees, yeah. they're really important. They're all three really important in planning for retirement. If you can get rid of those, minimize those, everything gets a little bit better. Makes a lot of sense. So this is who we are. Well, I'll tell you about my family is uh, there on the right. Uh, I have a son, Timothy, and a daughter, Emily, uh, and their spouses. Uh, and uh, we also have a new granddaughter. Ah, uh, so we're, we're enjoying that quite a bit. And this is me and my wife. I'm Daniel Rasby. This is my wife and our two kids here. Beautiful. Um, very young. We're just getting started. And this is our firm. So we actually have two companies. We have Higher Ground Financial Group and Higher Ground Legal. So Higher Ground Legal is my law firm where we dis uh, discuss and help with tax planning and estate planning. And Higher Ground Financial Group is our retirement planning firm where we focus on reducing risk and fees uh, and increasing income and retirement and things like that. And it says 99% virtual because we do sometimes give this presentation in person around the country. We fly around the country and, and, and speak in person. But all of our client meetings, they're all virtual. This uh, webinar is obviously virtual. And if you decide you want to click the link and schedule an appointment to meet us, that will also be a Zoom call or a Google Meet or something. Mm -hmm. So and we found that that's easier to be able to see uh, a lot of people, help a lot of people, and you don't have to take time out to drive somewhere and, and, and go meet us. Right, right. So we are nationwide. Uh, we have offices everywhere, and, and we meet with clients all over the country. Very good. And what do we do for our clients? Again, we focus on the three biggest killers to retirement, which are risk, fees, and taxes. Right. If we get rid of risk, fees, and taxes – then that increases income, it increases protection, helps you pass more to your family. And then we are fiduciaries. That means that everything we discuss with you must be in your best interest at all times, except for this uh, presentation. <laughs> right. This is not in your best interest this because is this is general information. It's educational. Mm -hmm. So it's not specific advice to you. Make sure you get fiduciary advice specific to your situation before you make any decisions. And when we put together a plan for our clients, we want to show you what a difference it makes with us versus without us. Right. right now, out there on your own, your life expectancy is like here. With me, it's you. Without me, here. With me, without me. With me, without me. So, I would uh, advise going home, but you know, it's up to you. That's a great movie. So yeah, Night and Day, very funny movie. This is not your life expectancy, but your money's life expectancy. You know, we want want to you have a much better, you know, a longer and and better access to your money with least amount of risk, fees, and taxes. Right. So anybody recognize this guy? If you do, put it in the chat in the in the comments. <laughs> I, I see there's see a, some fans. Yeah, a couple of Star Trek fans right. here recognizing this is actually Lieutenant Commander Data, the android from Star Trek. Well, the first picture, if you're not so much of a Star Trek fan like me, if you didn't really know who he was, the first picture was only insufficient data. <laughs> I see what you yes. did. <laughs> insufficient data leads to poor choices. We want to give you proper and complete information so you can make good decisions about your money. Right. So we have this tin can here. What's the story behind that? Tim? Well, let me tell you a little bit about the tin can. Tin can uh, was invented, uh, and you might not know this, back in 1810. And here's how it came about. Uh, Napoleon was setting out to conquer the world. And the limitation he had is that when they would run out of food, they couldn't keep going. So they could only go as far as their supplies would last. So he put a, a contest of sorts together to, to have somebody come up with a, a better way of storing the food so they could go further. And uh, somebody came up with the tin can. Great invention. They kept the food. The food didn't, uh, didn't uh, rot and deteriorate. Okay. Uh, but there was one problem. 
Well, what's missing? What what what's missing from that picture? It, it looks like it's a good can. It preserves food. Well, it was almost fifty years later before the can opener was invented. So you didn't have a can opener. How how could you get the uh, the uh, food out of the can? Right, right. So the the instructions were to use a hammer and chisel and, and just to break that open. But you can imagine uh, food going everywhere and 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 it's kind of a mess. Uh, so so what does that have to do with the money? Well, uh, very similarly. People work all their lives to accumulate, uh, and they put it into a container, put it into something that's safe and, and will protect it. Uh, but uh, when they go to take it out, sometimes there's a lot of hindrances, the taxes, the fees, the risk uh, that can really cause problems with getting it out. So uh, the, the, the problem is you don't have a good can opener. So. so that's what we do is we help you get the money out of the can, out of your retirement accounts with the least amount of risk, fees, and taxes. Right. That's, that's the whole idea. Mm-hmm. So what is our agenda for today? We're going to start with the market update, and we'll focus on taxes throughout the seminar. We'll talk about new tax laws, what's coming up, and you know how to minimize taxes, and we'll talk about estate planning as well. We're really going to hit risk, fees, taxes, risk, fees, taxes. Mm-hmm. And then if you want to schedule a meeting uh, to, to see us one-on-one, we'll be happy to give you specific answers. You can put them in the chat. We may or may not have time to get to specific answers today, but we can certainly answer one on one if you click the link and make the appointment with us. Right. So we had a bear market two years ago in 2022. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean? It means the market lost at least 20%. That's what a bear market is. So 2022 was a really bad year. Um, and then the next year, 2023, was a really good year. Mm-hmm. And so if you didn't take any money out at all during those two years, you probably ended up in you know back in, in again in January about where you were two years before, right? And that if you were taking money out, that's when it really hurts you, mm-hmm. right? Because it's going to be almost impossible to recover when there's a bad year. But it, hopefully you didn't have to take money out and you're still you're at least back to where you started with. And so then the question is, what's going to happen in the future, right? Well, we still have a lot of inflation. Um, and, you know, there's various uh, people talking about whether it's calmed down or not. You know, there's a lot of opinions on that. But this is something you can use to your advantage. Yeah. So rent inflation is kind of interesting. Uh, in Miami, rent rent went up 39% uh, over a two-year period. Over a two-year period. And that's for the renter, that, that's up. But for the investor, this is why it might be beneficial for somebody in retirement. It's a great hedge yeah. uh, because their mortgage, uh, what they're paying for the rental property stays about the same but the rental income comes up. So rental properties are one of the best inflation hedges that you can have in retirement. And we love to see our clients use rental properties uh, properly in, in as part of their portfolio. Um, and then bonds have not been doing well over the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. And that's because interest rates are going up. But that's kind of counterintuitive. Why are bonds going down when interest rates are going up? Right. Well, when people buy a bond, when you buy a bond at a, at a low interest rate, say 1% or 2%, and then everything starts going up. The interest rates start going up. The bond rates go up. Now people are wanting to buy the higher rates. And those lower rate bonds, nobody wants to buy them anymore. So if I have a 2% bond, you don't want to get that one from me. You, you're, you're going to buy whatever is the new on the market Correct. that's paying 4%. So I have to sell mine at a discount. Right. right. And that's what's happened sometimes so to some of these uh, uh, regional banks that were collapsing uh, last year. And... You know, there's a lot of banks that are still seeming to be in trouble. It's because they're holding these portfolios that when the depositors want their money out, they have to sell these bonds at a loss, and that's causing trillions of dollars of losses uh, in in the bond market. And that will probably continue as long as interest rates maintain a high or or increase. If interest rates go down a lot, that's that's going to be uh, something we'll have to see. Um, the, you know, this you got this guy Jerome Powell, <laughs> chairman of the Federal Reserve. He said in 2021 that inflation would be temporary. And then in uh, 22, he said, this is an exact quote, word for word, we now better understand how little we understand about inflation. <laughs> That's helpful, right? <laughs> He's supposed to be the one fixing it, right? Right. <laughs> and the Fed really seems to control the market. and That's because when they raise interest rates, it makes it harder for businesses to borrow money, and that does cause the market to decline. And so if you look at this chart, this kind of looks like the market crashes, right? In 2000, right. 2002, and then again 2008, and then a short one in 2020. But these are actually the Federal Reserve interest rates. Mm. And you can see they were raising them in the early uh, part of 2000, and then the market crashed. So then they dropped rates, and then they started raising again, raising again, raising again. And then the market crashed in 2008, so they dropped the rates mm-hmm. again. 
and then they raised it again, and then the market crashed at the beginning of COVID, and it was a very short crash because the government put several trillion dollars into the economy right away to try to recover, and then, of course, rates had to start rising quickly to combat inflation. Right. So we're at a point where it's it's kind of plateaued for a while. You know, there's talk about are they going to raise more? Are they going to lower more? They might do some of both, but it hasn't really dropped yet, and that's because the market has not had a huge crash yet. Mm-hmm. And I think once that happens, that's when the the interest rates will really drop. And the Federal Reserve is probably going to have to keep pushing those rates higher and higher until that big crash happens Mm -hmm. because they they need to keep inflation low. Right. So what about the next crash? How big is it going to be? Harry Dent is a a big big deal advisor. He says there could be an 86% drop in the upcoming crash. 86%. As bad as 1929. Hmm. You know, then you know Morgan Stanley was saying that when the commercial real estate crash comes soon, that'll be worse than two thousand eight. So what's going on with commercial real estate? Well, you know, one of the things is a lot of regional banks own a lot of their uh, a lot of their investments are in re- real estate, commercial real estate. Well, the problem is that people aren't going back into the office. People left the office and they're not going back in. A lot of the offices are sitting empty, and so they're not renewing their leases. And so people who own those buildings now are stuck with a lot of vacancies. And this is a pandemic era problem, right? Mm-hmm. So it's only been, you know, three, four years when a lot of this has uh, has really started to come uh, uh, to the forefront. Right. But a lot of office buildings are on five-year leases or five-year balloon payments. So we're only now starting to see m- many of those buildings come up for renewal, and that's when they're either not getting renewed or, or they're just foreclosing. And so that is going to cause a domino effect that could be a really bad uh, commercial real estate crash. Right. Now, over the long term, the market's going to go up. I mean, I could find you 10 articles saying, you know, in the next couple of years will be the best years in market history as well. Uh-huh. So everybody has different opinions on when the bad years will come. The thing is, bad years always come. It's just a matter of do they come next year? Do they come in five years? But when you're retired, you're going to have several more bad years during your lifetime. Mm-hmm. What do you do with those bad years? How do you protect from loss? That's the most important thing. Because imagine if you get a cut on your arm and blood is gushing out everywhere, so he rushes you to the hospital and, he say, and the doctor gets ready to stitch you up, and you say, no, the doctor, wait, I want the blood that I lost to come back in my arm first, and then he stitched me up. <laughs> well, no, the priority is stop the bleeding. Right. The most important thing is don't lose money. In fact, Warren Buffett. That's right, yeah, has, his two rules, right? Yeah, rule number one. What's Warren Buffett's rule number one? Don't lose money. Don't lose money. And then uh, rule number two is what? Don't forget rule number one. (laughs) Don't forget rule number one. So Warren Buffett, one of the most uh, successful investors of all Mm -hmm. time, he understands that the priority is to preserve and not to lose what you have. Mm -hmm. And yes, you want to grow, but the most important thing is don't lose money. So let's talk about how that affects you when you're really retired. Sequence of returns. This is a phrase, and you can Google sequence of returns. There's a lot of uh, good articles about it, but it's a big risk in retirement. So imagine you have $100,000, and you retired in 2000. So on the left side of the screen here, 2000 to 2019, a 20-year period. If you retired then and you wanted to take 4% out each year, which your advisor says 4% is a good amount and a little bit increase for inflation each year, well, at the end of 20 years, you'd be almost out of money. You only got $8,000 left. Why is that? Well, the first three years were bad years. So by the time, end, end of the third year, you're down to $50,000 or so because you took money out in the bad years. Mm-hmm. And even though there were some really good returns later on, it did not make up for that. So you, it's impossible to recover because you keep taking money out. Now look on the right side. Well, this is the same returns. We just took the three bad years from the beginning and we put them at the end. We took the good years at the end and we put them at the beginning. So you started with a 28% return. It's the same exact um, market returns, just a different order. Mm -hmm. And so now when you take money out and you have good years early on in retirement, then at the end of that time, in 20 years, you got $120,000 where you started with 100 compared to being completely or almost completely out of money money in the first scenario. So the order of returns really makes a difference Mm -hmm. in how much you can take out and not run out of money in retirement. So so if you could choose, 
If you could choose, it'd yeah. be a lot easier. Exactly, <laughs> but you don't know if right. you're retiring now or you're or you you have retired recently. Mm-hmm. You don't know what the next several years are going to hold, and if they are bad, you don't you can't really afford to also take money out of those accounts Correct. in the bad years. But let's say you know, if, I mean, you're here on the, on this webinar, so you, you probably did not retire 20 years ago or 22 years ago. So what what did the market actually do for you? Well, over the first 22 years of this century. From January 2000 to December 2022, the market went up, and you were riding it out. What was and put in the comments if you have a, if you have a guess, what was the average rate of return for those 22 years? What do you think the average rate of return was for 22 years? Hmm. I see somebody said six percent, eight, eight percent, ten percent. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, somebody said somebody said five percent. Well, it was actually 4.28%. Hmm. Not, not a lot of people yeah. realize that. It was not a very good return for 22 years. 4.28% was all that it happened. And that's because we lost 50% in the first three years. When okay. you lose 50%, you have to gain 100% just to break even. Mm-hmm. Then you lose 50%, you have to gain 100% just to break even. So for the 13 years, first 13 years, that's a 0% average return. And then it went up a lot, then it crashed, and it went up again. But over that time period, 22 years, the average was only 4%. Now, here's the really depressing part. And this is what kind of what we talked about at the beginning of the seminar, is taking more risk does not necessarily mean you get a better result. Yes. In January 2000, you could have bought a 20-year <laughs> treasury for a guaranteed 6.86%, guaranteed by the federal government, the strongest guarantee you can have. And if you did that with a million dollars in 2000, 20 years later, You'd have two point four million if you left it all in the market with all the ups and downs, or you'd have three point seven million if it was in twenty year treasuries. Hmm. Wow! So are you suggesting we move everything to treasuries? Yeah, go sell everything you have <laughs> and buy twenty year treasuries. No, the the but the point is, yeah. risk and reward are not linked. Correct. Not always. Mm-hmm. So you need to think very critically about does taking this risk actually accomplish something that I'm trying to accomplish, mm-hmm. and. You know, you may already have enough money saved that if you don't lose the money you have, you're going to be okay, but you can't afford a big crash. So, you know, sometimes uh, hindsight <laughs> is twenty twenty. Look at this dog that yeah. the owner taught to do the shell game and play the shell game. Can you find the treat? Can you find the treat? <laughs> oh, you oh, found it. You found it. Good, good for you. Now, uh, look what you missed out on. Uh-oh. Now he's going to spit it out. <laughs> He doesn't want that. Yes. I, that's kind of what we feel like sometimes. Yeah. We realize, oh, I After could have I could have done all this. Mm-hmm. And we can't go back and fix the past, mm-hmm. but we can make plans for how to protect the money in the future. And you know, some people say, Tim, you know, you, Daniel, you, you picked, cherry picked. Uh, you cherry picked the perfect time in history to make your point. Mm-hmm. Yes, I did. Uh, that's, that, that was, the, that was the, uh, what I was trying to do. But even if we go back farther, let's look at every 15-year period since 1996 – You'd put on a year, take off a year, and over that time, it was only 5.16 was the average return for all those different periods. Only one time was it above 8%. Wow. In an average for 15 years. And so uh, why do we have this myth that the market does really, really well? Well, We remember the good years. You guys uh, on this webinar, you probably remember a really great year last year. Mm -hmm. And it's it's already starting to fade how terrible the year was before. Yeah. It's only two years ago, right? But it's, it's, it, we try to block out the bad and we remember the good. It's but, kind, of, kind of like golf, right? Yes. You, you remember all the good shots, but you kind of block out all the ones that exactly. ended up That's in the, why you in keep the going back, pond, right? right? And so, I mean, even before this 13-year period of zero returns, there was a 26-year period of zero returns. Mm. Before that, there was a 52-year period of zero returns. So imagine putting a dollar in, waiting 52 years, and you still have $1. Mm. That's inflation adjusted. But still, you can only buy $1 worth of items at the, at the end of 52 years. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Now, individual stocks, individual companies, those have done well. And and when you buy for dividends and the company is doing well and is paying you a dividend, those can provide consistent income. So that's what most people have historically bought stocks for. But in the last you know, 20, 30 years, the focus has been on, oh, let's just grow, let's go, grow, grow. Mm-hmm. It doesn't grow as well as people think it does. Mm-hmm. And this is every bear market since 1929, every time it crashed by at least 20%. And we see that it's happened every five years. Mm-hmm. It takes a year and a half to hit the bottom, so it's not a, a sudden thing. thing. And on average, it's 
if you lose 39%, it's going to take you a really long time to recover, especially if you need to be spending money in retirement. Mm -hmm. So make sure you have a plan for risk. And so what, what do you normally do with risk? Well, diversify. they say diversify, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, so your advisor might say, you know, you need to get things in different boats and you need to move things around a little bit. So, now so you, let's I, diversify, right? So I, said, I have one boat, but now I have five boats. Now mm -hmm. I'm diversified, right? Yeah. So you think, well, that's safer until the tsunami comes <laughs> and now they're all done. Uh, they're all in trouble. So what is true diversification? True diversification uh, in, the, in a risk standpoint, that is uh, contract versus opinion-based mm -hmm. assets. Most of your money that you think of as assets is probably in opinion-based assets. It's stocks, bonds, mutual funds, even your house mm -hmm. is based on market opinion. Not what you think it's worth, but what somebody's willing to pay for it. Right. Even like precious metals and things like that typically are opinion Exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. And and so contract based asset, that will be a true diversification, getting something that's outside of market opinion that you have a contract, you know what it's worth, like your bank account, mm -hmm. like a CD, like treasuries we talked about. Um, a and, lease. You know, a lease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you have a rental property, that's contractual. The value of the property is opinion, but the leases are contractual, right? Mm -hmm. So diversify between contract and opinion based assets. That's a true diversification. And then there's also tax diversification, Correct. which we're going to get to in just a minute. Mm -hmm. Remember the three biggest killers to retirement? <laughs> risk, fees, fees and taxes. And taxes. Mm -hmm. So we talked about risk. Again, insufficient data leads to bad decisions. So hopefully that gives you some better data to make some good decisions on risk. So now we get to fees. One thing that could be worse than a market loss can be high fees. <laughs> and you know, you mentioned at the beginning of the seminar, you know, people think they're, they'd be paying 1% in fees. And that may be true, but if you have mutual funds in your portfolio, you might be paying another 1.23% average expense ratio. That's according to the New York Times. Um, you have trading costs, cash drag, according to Forbes. Often when we analyze clients' portfolios, we find that they're paying 3 or even 4% in fees rather than the 1% they were sure they were paying. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important to reduce the fees as much as possible. But let's say you only had 1%. How mm -hmm. bad is that really? How yes. bad is the 1% fee? So, so if I had half a million dollars, uh, Daniel, five hundred thousand dollars, what could you do for me then? Well, let's say, let's say you come to me as the advisor, you give me five hundred thousand dollars, and I'm going to beat the market. Remember, the market okay. only did four point two eight percent for the last twenty two years or so. I'll give you five percent return. Okay, that's one point two million dollars of total growth over the next twenty five years. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds good. So, so for that, I'm going to I'm going to charge you a one percent fee. Does okay. that seem reasonable? That seems reasonable. Yeah. All right. Well. Remember, I'm going to also charge you a fee on the money you had to begin with that I didn't even earn for you. Okay. So every okay. year I'm going to charge that fee. It's going to get bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. So over time, you pay $217,000 in fees. Wow. When you put a real number on it, it sounds higher than a percentage, doesn't it? Does. It does. It sounds yeah. so much bigger when you put a dollar number on it. And that's that's not all. What else do you lose if you don't have the 217000 in your account? Well, you can't do anything with that money. Exactly. It's so you lose the growth on it, right? Right. So the growth what, that you lost was another $159,000. Mm -hmm. So really, it wasn't two seventeen; It was $376,000 that you wow. lost to a 1% fee. Mm -hmm. And so when you factor that in to the $1.2 million of growth, take out the fees, it's 31% of your growth went to fees. Hmm. Incredible. So a 1% fee became 31% of your growth. Make sure that you know what you're getting for your fees. It's not to say all fees are bad. But, right. you know, sometimes there's a specific value you can get for a fee, but you better make sure that you understand the true amount of fees you're paying and whether the service and value you're getting is actually worth that big of a chunk of your money. Right. So here's a case study uh, to talk about both risk and fees. Uh, Bob and Carol, clients of ours, not their real names. <laughs> and uh, they, they had $1.6 million of assets that they weren't spending yet because they had pensions and Social Security for their basic expenses. But they wanted to be traveling. They were just afraid they might run out of money if they spend too much. And, uh, you know, but they were one, sure of one thing. They were sure they were only paying 1% in fees. Mm -hmm. But when we <laughs> did the calculation, we found that they, they were actually paying 3% in fees on average, not mm -hmm. 1%. So that's $49,000 a year. Wow, that's in a big fees. chunk. That's a college tuition. <laughs> it is. Right? And uh, they were also exposed to a $790,000 loss in the next market crash. And that means they would have to gain 97% just to break even. This is why they were concerned about spending money. They said, mm -hmm. well, if the market crashes, 
I would be completely out of money if I'm if I'm spending. Mm-hmm. So we were able to reduce the fees. It was st- still about one percent, but it's a lot lower than they were paying before. So that saved them over thirty thousand dollars a year, and we'll hopefully get it down farther as well. But the biggest thing is now in their risk factor, they can only lose one hundred fifty thousand. Only nine point four percent is the worst case scenario. And so if that happens, they only need a 10% return one year to break even. And that's right. happened in, in, you know, the market sometimes does 10% in, in, in year. one year. Yeah. So they now they feel a lot more comfortable spending money and not worrying about running out. So we talked about risk. We talked about fees. And what's the third one? Uh, taxes. Taxes. So now we're at taxes. We're going to discuss the new tax law, uh, recent tax law changes and new ones that are coming up. We're going to avoid the political and stick to the actionable. I know it's an election year. You're not going to tell me who to vote for? No, we're not okay. going to say who is or is not in power or who should be and what they might do. Mm-hmm. All of that's up in the air until the election So and until they actually pass bills. And we know Congress is <laughs> good at doing one thing is not passing stuff. Right. So it, we're just going to talk about what's already on the books right now. Mm-hmm. And we'll start with you will pay taxes. Resistance is futile. <laughs> Another Star Trek. Getting the idea that I'm a Star Trek fan yet? So um, you will pay taxes, resistance, futile. It's a scary picture, right? Right. But this is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Why is it a good thing? Mm-hmm. If you know this, if you know you have to pay taxes, you can pay them on your terms. Because, mm-hmm. Tim, if, if you have a choice to pay taxes the way the government wants you to or the way you want to, which do you think is going to cost you more? I suspect what they want me to. Exactly. Right? So if you wait to the government schedule mm-hmm. for your taxes – that could be a disaster. Mm, yeah. And, I mean, imagine this slinky. So I have a toy in my hand, a little slinky. And this is your money now. As you save and grow and invest, this is your total wealth. Would you rather pay tax on this or pay tax on that? Right? right. It's much better to pay tax on the seed and not the harvest, especially mm-hmm. if taxes are going up. And they are going up. Mm-hmm. So this law is already on the books. In 2024, we have these tax rates. This is for the married brackets. But they're increasing. The 12% is going up to 15, 22 is going to 25, 24 going to 28. These are increasing in just two years. In 2026, the rates are going to go up. You might have heard this. If you're watching this uh, seminar, you might have heard this on the news. You might have seen articles about it. A lot of people were aware the tax cuts are expiring. But what they're not talking about is the inflation adjustments will wreak havoc on this. They're going to change drastically. So... It's not just that the rates are going up, but the brackets are going to shrink. So look, take a look at the 24% bracket. A lot of our clients are in this bracket. You can have $200,000 of income all the way up to $383,000 of income, and it's still 24%. That's this year. What happens in two years? Well, it becomes 28%, but the bracket stops at 233. Hmm. So now you can't have more than 233,000. Otherwise, now you're in the 33% bracket. Mm-hmm. So if you're if you're making two hundred two hundred fifty thousand, you might think, well, I can do a hundred thousand dollar Roth conversion, and I'll mm-hmm. still be in twenty four percent bracket. Mm-hmm. Well, in a couple of years, mm-hmm. you won't be able to do that. You, you might up, even be in the thirty five percent. Exactly, you're you're going to go far. up t- uh, two, maybe even three brackets mm-hmm. when you thought you were going up only one bracket. Mm-hmm. So it's very important to plan for how can you minimize the impact of these tax changes. And one way is to take advantage of the high rates there are now for the next couple of years. Taxes are on sale. So paying them now is is a good thing in many cases. Right. Then you have long-term capital gains. These are not changing in two years. A lot of people assume that they're always going to pay 15 or 20% in capital gains, but that's not always true. If your income is under 100000 you know, it's 94, but plus the standard deduction is like 100, 115, 120000 almost. That's that's not going to be, be taxed at all. So you could have that kind of uh, income, and then all your capital gains is tax-free. Mm-hmm. So if you plan ahead and you know when those uh, thresholds are going to be uh, hit, then you can try to avoid all the capital gains as well. Right. But the real tax system is more complicated than just the different uh, you know, brackets because mm-hmm. you can Google those. We're here to talk about required minimum distributions, Social Security, Medicare. These are th- things that impact you when you're retired. Mm-hmm. And I have uh, slides on all these things, but I want to talk about Medicare first because we don't have a separate slide on it. And I want you to think, if you're watching this webinar, don't miss the forest for the trees. Many people get concerned about higher Medicare premiums. Well, if I do a Roth conversion, they're going to charge me more for Medicare. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you you could pay almost $1,000 a month for Medicare if you have too high of an income. Okay. 
Well, that's okay. Why is that okay? Well, if I'm going to save you a million dollars in taxes hmm. by doing Roth conversions and other strategies, then I think it's worth it to pay a little bit more for Medicare for a couple of years. It's a lot more you than know, a thousand dollars a month. Yeah, maybe a few tens of thousands of yeah. dollars over the next couple of years. And then when you're done with the conversions, Medicare price drops back down again because now you don't have the high income. So it's a temporary thing. And we want to look at your total tax burden, mm -hmm. not just tax from one area. And we want you to pay as little as possible overall. Mm -hmm. Not just taxes, but remember, risk, fees, and taxes. They're and not all just for one year. Yeah, not for just the, for one year. So that's the difference between a CPA mm -hmm. and a tax attorney like me is we're very proactive. And I take a look at what the lifetime Longer term. Yeah, what the lifetime impact is, right? Not just, oh, save some tax this year by deferring it, deferring it. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about required distributions. What are RMDs? How do they work? Well, re required minimum distributions, so they, they give you a tax deferment with certain investments that they say you don't have to pay your taxes right IRAs, now. IRAs, TSPs, 401ks, things like that, right? Right. They say you take that out, you don't pay any tax on that money, uh, but you eventually will have to pay taxes. Not tax, uh, you're not avoiding taxes, you're just deferring them. And at certain points, they will say, now it's time to pay those taxes. Uh, currently, it's at age 73. Uh, in, a, in a few years, actually less than 10 years now, it'll be up to 75. But at that rate, that's when they're gonna, the government's going to say, now you have to pay the taxes on those. You deferred long enough. It's time to pay so, those taxes. So at that time, you have to divide your account balance by your life expectancy. You might not mm -hmm. know how long you're going to live, but the IRS does. <laughs> they decided at 73, you're going to live 26.5 years. And so you're going to... Take out if you have a million dollars, take out thirty-seven thousand dollars and pay tax on it. But even if you don't need it, even if you don't need it, if you right. don't take it out, you got a fifty percent penalty, hmm. and then you got to pay tax on the entire amount anyway. So it's it's almost all going to go away taxes. So you need hmm. to take it out, and every year you divide by a smaller number, so you take more out, and to, until you're age one hundred twenty, then you take out <laughs> half the money each year. But this uh, RMD thing is really. Um, a pain for a lot of people because you're forced to take the money out. So there are things you can do to alleviate the RMDs. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. And before we get to that, we want to talk about capital gains. So there's something called phantom gains. You might have gotten a 1099 even though you didn't even spend money in your mutual funds. You didn't take any money out. You didn't sell anything, but you got a 1099. You got to pay taxes. So why is that? Well, so what happens within those funds, so you have some a fund manager and he's looking at uh, what the funds are doing and he may reallocate or rebalance uh, and then selling some of the appreciated stocks uh, and then rebalancing it. But when he sells those, uh, then there's a capital gain on those. And he doesn't pay that capital gain. No, He's got to pass that it gets on passed to right on to you. Right so on that's us. how you can have a, a taxable event even if you didn't spend any money. And even if you took a loss. Even if you, you took, you a, took loss, a loss. Somehow, you might have overall, overall been, might have been a loss, yeah. but uh, you pay the tax. And also, capital gains can create ordinary income tax because they can cause other parts of your income to now be taxable. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Mm -hmm. Then there's this excise tax, 3.8% net investment income tax. Uh, if you have higher income, if you have capital gains, it's just on top of everything else. And so we'll see if they ever mess with that. Uh, they've threatened to in the past, but for now it's 3.8%. Then there's Social Security. So you have a choice of 62 through age 70 to start your Social Security. When should you take it? Put it in the comments. Should you wait as long as possible? Should you take it as early as possible? What should you do with Social Security? And I see a couple people put it in, in there. Mo most people are saying wait as long as possible. Wait right. as long as possible. You get more money. And that's the prevailing wisdom. That's what most yeah. uh, advisors say. And that's wrong. Okay. Take Social Security as soon as possible. Well, why is that? Well... <coughs> Excuse me. There's a few different reasons why you would want to take it as soon as possible. But I want to caveat that it depends on a couple things. So full retirement age, 66 or 67, if you're still working, you can't take it before that age. Otherwise, you're going to be penalized. You can limit it to $22,000 of income, and then <laughs> you're going to reduce uh, drastically the Social Security yeah. you're going to get. So it, if you are still working, then you can't really take Social Security unless you're self-employed or you have a business. There are ways to hide the money or defer it legally for several years. But in general, you have to wait at least until either you retire or you reach 66 or 67. Once you're past that age, you can take it with no penalties. But it still increases until age 70. So why would you want to take it early? I'm going to give you a couple reasons. 
so first of all, was a tax reason. When I heard Social Security would be taxed, it was I was so frustrated because there's a tax <laughs> coming out of my paycheck now, and you're telling me when I receive it in the future, <laughs> I, I'm going to pay tax again on it. Right. But I reassured Daniel that he's so young that by the time he gets around to it, he, there won't even be the Social Security. So oh, That doesn't make me feel any better. <laughs> right. Now it's just a tax. It's right. even worse. <laughs> but, but in any case, if you're going to get Social Security, if you're of the age that you'll receive Social Security, they do tax it. And the way they calculate it is they take half the Social Security plus all your other income, even non-taxable interest like muni bonds that normally doesn't count. So all of that gets lumped together, and this is called provisional income. But only half the Social Security is counted for that calculation. And then if you're over certain thresholds, you could pay tax on 85% of the Social Security. 15% of it will be tax-free. The other 85% is added to your income, depending. So let's use an example. Let's say, uh, Tim, you're retiring uh, today. Yeah, so I want to retire today. And but I want to, I want my wife, she'll, she'll con she won't start collecting Social Security, but I'll start collecting it today. So you could each take it for 20000 but you're saying she's going to wait and yeah. let hers grow. You're going to take your $20,000 yep. a year. And then you need $60,000 uh, to live on, so mm -hmm. you're going to take $40,000 out of your IRA. So while that's 50000 of provisional income, because only half the Social Security, 10000 plus 40000 IRA, is 50000 of provisional income. And when we do the calculations, 11000 of that's taxable. Okay. I know that's complicated. Well, mm -hmm. Let's use an, another example to try to break it down. So I'm going to retire also this year, and my wife and I will both take Social Security for 20000 each, and that does two things. One, it reduces the strain on my investments, so I don't have to take as much okay. out of the IRAs. I only need mm -hmm. 20000 out of the IRAs. But also my provisional income is lower because, again, only half the Social Security counts. 20000 plus 20000 is 40000 So my taxable benefit is only $4,000. Okay. And that might not seem like a big difference, but on the tax return, it's the difference between Tim paying $2,500 or me and my wife paying zero. And we also have another couple thousand dollars of room in the standard deduction so that even if we want to take another two or $3,000 out, we still wouldn't pay any tax. Hmm. So we could have $5,000 a year more every year in retirement because we took Social Security early. Wow. So that's one reason. Mm -hmm. Another reason is the break even. So, you know, if you retired right now with the most you could possibly get from Social Security, having maxed it out, that's twenty five hundred dollars a month. If you wait till seventy, you get forty five hundred dollars a month. That sounds better, doesn't yeah. it? It's yeah, like two thousand well, dollars yeah. a month more. Right, that's a big deal. But what do you miss if you wait? You miss the twenty five hundred dollars you could get mm -hmm. now for ninety six months. Mm -hmm. That's a two hundred forty six thousand dollar loss. Wow. Yeah. It takes a long time to break even. It. In fact, it takes 10 years to break even. You're going to get more money by waiting, but you have to make up for all that lost money. Mm -hmm. And so by age 80, you finally break even. But wait, there's more. It's like an infomercial. <laughs> you have opportunity costs. If you're considering whether or not you should take Social Security, chances are you don't Probably need it, to, need to, it. to survive, mm -hmm. right? You, you could survive without it. And so if you don't really need it, invest it or spend it and then let your investments keep growing. Either way, you have opportunity costs. Now that brings your loss to 315000 Now your break-even point is age 83. Now, Tim, if you're 62 today, what is the exact life expectancy of an American turning 62 today? Hmm. I, ha I have a hunch it's probably close to 83. It's exactly <laughs> 83. So the Social Security Department is not stupid. They right. want to give you the same amount of money whether you take it early or you take it late. Why does it, and people, people say it's an 8% increase every year. Yes, because you have an 8% increase of chance of dying next right. year. They give you more money because you have one less year to live, and they're right. trying to give you the same amount of money regardless of when you take it. Mm -hmm. So there's the tax savings, which we talked about earlier, and then the break even analysis. In most cases, if you can do something with the money, if you can use it for something, it makes sense to take it early. And then you might be thinking, well, why is it that you're the only one saying this? All the other articles, all the TV shows, all the uh, uh, you know magazines that I've read, they all say, even my right. advisor says, take uh, to wait as long as possible to take Social Security. Well, that advice is given for the average person, the average American. The average American made only $30,000 a year. The average American retires with less than $10,000 saved. The average American only has Social Security only. In retirement, so they mm -hmm. have to work as long as possible, well into their seventies, just to put food on the table. So yes, they need to wait as long as possible. But 
you are watching the seminar, you are not the average American. Why? Because you sign up to watch a tax seminar, which means you're paying taxes, which means you have higher than the average income. So in most cases, the people watching the seminar, it can re- help you to use not average advice, but advice tailored specifically to you, which means in many cases to take your Social Security mm-hmm. earlier. And so, you know, a lot of things can have a cascading effect. Look at this. John and Jane married filing jointly, age 73, 60000 of combined Social Security, 15000 of capital gains, and $45,000 of required distributions mm-hmm. that they didn't want to spend, but they uh, had to anyway because mm-hmm. happy birthday, you're 73, pay tax. Right. <laughs> we put them through our tax calculator, and we found that even though they were in the 12% bracket, they were actually paying almost 50% wow. on Which part of their income. How did that happen? Well, the required distribution caused 12% in taxes, $120, right, for a $1,000 withdrawal. But that caused 850 of Social Security to now be taxable at 12% for $102. That caused 1850 of capital gains to be taxable at 15% for 277 So the total tax burden on just a $1,000 required distribution was $499.50. Out of 1000 wow. And so that is... A huge deal if mm-hmm. you can plan ahead for it and you know these things are coming. Don't use the CPA advice of being reactionary. Oh, well, I guess you owe $499. No. Think about it ahead of time and reduce your taxes for the long term. Stop deferring taxes. Mm-hmm. It's a terrible time <laughs> right now to defer yeah. taxes. And and so if you're confused so far, if, if we've confused you thoroughly on how taxes work, what they are, <laughs> this guy on Twitter has some great advice for you. He said, my son asked what taxes are. So I gave him a bag of M&Ms and said, you got to give some of these back to me. I know how much you have to give back to me, but you got to guess. If you guess wrong, you go to jail. Right. And so and I can that. change the rules every time I want. Exactly. Right. So the, the government can change the rules any time they want. And uh, and so that doesn't, that doesn't really give me a lot of comfort, <laughs> but that is how taxes work. Yeah. So what can you do if you are not the average American? We talked about that a minute ago. If you're watching this seminar, you're not the average American – Maybe take Social Security early. That would be a, a one good thing you could do. What other things you could do? Diversify. Right. Diversify not just among in risk. We talked about that contract versus opinion assets. Mm-hmm. But diversify among account types. You've got IRA, Roth, non-qualified, other tax-free accounts, real estate. These are all taxed differently. Mm-hmm. So you want to have several different types of taxes that you can choose so you don't just use tax-deferred products, only mm-hmm. where appropriate. That way you can choose which accounts to use depending on today's tax environment, which one is best to take withdrawals from. Mm -hmm. And then consider which assets should be held in which account type. And this one is one of my uh, pet peeves because as a tax attorney, I see people make investment decisions, and that but they use the wrong tax uh, status for that account. So one good uh, example is real estate. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to ask. I heard real estate's good to put into an IRA. Yeah, so many people <laughs> do take real estate and they and they buy uh, real estate inside their IRA in a self-directed IRA. That's a terrible idea in most situations. Why? Well, if you have real estate in an IRA, you got to pay really big admin fees uh, for the third-party manager. You got to do evaluation a couple times a year, uh, appraisals. You have to uh, be very careful having enough cash sitting aside, not even invested, because if you have a problem, you got to pay for a new roof. You can't contribute to the IRA a mm. big chunk. You got to use cash in there. If there's no cash in there, everything falls apart. You can't get a loan inside the IRA in most cases, and not the same terms anyway as a residential loan. It's a lot harder. And the biggest thing is you don't get the tax benefits of owning real estate. All the uh, income it can, in many cases, be tax free if you have it outside your IRA because of mm-hmm. depreciation. But you don't get that benefit and the stepped up basis at death for the kids. Mm. Yeah. So it's just a mess when you have real estate inside your IRA. What's another one people get backwards? And, uh, and don't get me wrong. I, I love real estate. I think mm-hmm. it just should be outside the IRA. What's another one people get backwards is annuities. Some people buy annuities in retirement. And when they do that, some of them buy it with non-qualified assets. They sell stocks that are highly appreciated so they can buy an annuity. Well, that creates a tax mess. Let's say you sell your Apple stock. You pay capital gains. So you didn't have to pay the capital gains because it was long-term, it was deferred, so mm-hmm. you didn't have to pay them. But now you sell the Apple stock, pay I capital know. gains. Now you move to the annuity. The annuity grows. You take the money out, and you pay income tax. Mm-hmm. So now you've paid capital gains when you didn't need to, and you created an income tax as well. So it, it, it's, a, it's an extra tax that you didn't need to have. If you were going to get in the annuity, 
and you had IRA money, you could move the IRA to the annuity, no tax. When you take the money out, it's taxable, but it was already taxable. So you're not creating a new tax hmm. by okay. doing that. And you can even convert it to Roth. So whatever the investment is that you're considering, make sure you consider which tax status is the most efficient for that specific type of investment. Makes sense. All right, and take advantage of rental properties. I like those in retirement, just not inside the IRA. Don't wait until 73 for the RMDs. Take them early. If you already are 73, you can take more than the RMD and do something else with it. What can you do with it? We'll talk about that in a second. Roth conversions and cruts. So, Roth conversions. What is a Roth? What's the difference between an IRA and a Roth, Tim? Well, a Roth uh, is you put the money in tax uh, after taxes. You pay the taxes on the money. So you're not deferring uh, it. You're not paying deferring taxes it. On Pay the taxes seed now. Yeah. And not the harvest. Correct. Right. But you're if you're watching the seminar, you might have made too much money to do a Roth in, mm. in the past. So how could this apply to you? Well, they do have an option where you can convert. Uh, you can do a Roth conversion, and that's open to anybody. And is there income cap uh, on that? No income cap. No, you no can make a million dollars a day and, and still <laughs> convert. All right. Uh, convert to Roth. So if I have a million dollars in my IRA, I could take a hundred or two hundred thousand mm -hmm. and convert it to Roth. I just have to pay the tax on it. Right. Right. So then there are a couple five year rules to be aware of. Mm -hmm. So if you're under fifty nine and a half, you do have to wait five years before you touch the money. Mm -hmm. But let's say you're retired and you're doing this. So you're 60, 65, 70, you're doing this, you have to wait five years before you can access the growth after the conversion. Okay. So right. if I convert $200,000 to Roth this year, I pay the tax, and then next year it grows, now it's 220000 So I, I can spend the 200000 mm -hmm. but the extra 20000 of growth, I gotta wait four more years until the five years are up, then I can spend that. So that's the one rule to be aware of. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing is there's no required distributions. Yes. So if you don't really need this money to live on, you want to leave it to the kids, there's no required distributions. You can keep it there growing tax-free for the rest of your life. So take advantage of the new tax laws. They're expiring in just a couple years. The rates are going to go up dramatically. It's better to pay a little bit more tax now than to pay a lot more later. Mm -hmm. How much do you actually save? You know, We talked about this at the beginning. You know, This is a client of ours. She had a million dollars in her IRA, and she was going to leave it to her daughter. She didn't need it to live on. She had a pension. So in this case, we calculated she was going to pay over $500,000 in taxes just on RMDs at the time of withdrawals. Then she didn't need the money, so she was going to reinvest it and pay another $200,000 in taxes. And then when she dies, her daughter is going to pay another $400,000 in taxes. So really, she's going to pay $1.1 million in taxes. The current balance is only a $1 million now. Right. It's going to grow, pay tax, grow, pay tax, grow. Mm -hmm. You're never going to catch up. So if she converts it to Roth, costs her three hundred grand. But that's it. So it's an $850,000 tax savings just by paying the tax early. And that's assuming that taxes never go up for the rest of her life. How many of you think that's very <laughs> likely? The taxes will never go up for the rest of your life? Probably. If they do, then she saves even more money. Mm -hmm. But at a minimum, this is an $850,000 savings of taxes by doing the Roth conversions. It definitely makes yeah. sense. If you are planning to leave any money to your kids, then it's it's a really important thing. Mm -hmm. Now you might be thinking, well, even three hundred thousand. I mean, that's a that's a great savings, but I don't have three hundred thousand sitting around in the in the, in the checking account. So where do I get the money to pay the tax? I have a solution for that right. too. It's called a CRUT. So CRUT stands for Charitable Remainder Unit Trust. And if you don't like charity, just forget that part for a minute. We'll get come back to that. How does it work? You have highly appreciated stocks or rental properties. Mm -hmm. So if I if I rent a property, what what are my options if I want to sell it? Well, if I sell it, I'm gonna to have to pay capital gains, uh, or I could do a 1031 exchange and mm -hmm. buy another property. Okay. But, but if, if I don't I, want a property, then what do you what do you do? Well, well, you could donate it to a charitable trust, mm -hmm. and if you do that, there's no capital gains; it gets deferred indefinitely. So they're still due, but but you don't ever pay them because of the way the trust works. And so what you've done is you've avoided the capital gains legally. It, it's going into this trust, and then you get a giant tax deduction up to 50% or more, depending on your age, of what you put into the trust. But wait, there's more. <laughs> then you get a pension. The trust gives you a pension, 5% for the rest of your life, if you go to most attorneys. If you go to me, I make you the trustee, so you can get 6%, maybe right. you get a 1% trustee fee. And then when you die, the remainder goes to charity. So that's the, the downside if you don't like charity. But if you do uh, have some charitable intent, but you don't have like a perfect charity in mind, 
you can create your own charity. Have you right. heard about the Trump Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, the Bill Gates Foundation, the Kennedy Foundation? So you these want, are you want me to give to them? <laughs> well, you, these are family <laughs> foundations, right. right? That it's legal to donate to yourself if it's set up properly and it's a legitimate charity. So you can do that if you want. You could have the money sent to a, a charity that your kids are running. Um, but in any case, you get these upfront tax benefits that are huge. Mm. Let's use an example. This lady had half a million dollars in highly appreciated stock, Microsoft stock, let's say. And if she sold it, she would have to pay over $100,000 in taxes. By donating it to the trust, she pays no taxes, so she saves $100,000. Then she gets a $222,000 charitable deduction that she can take over to her IRA and make it Roth without any taxes at all. Okay. And then she gets $25,000, actually $30,000 with the trustee fee, $30,000 a year. This mm -hmm. part's taxable for the rest of her life. Now, in this case, this client, she doesn't uh, need the money because she already has a pension. She doesn't need another pension. So she chooses to use that money and buy a life insurance policy that replaces the $500,000 that she gave to the trust. So now that's tax-free for the kids, and the charity gets half a million dollars when she dies, and the kids get half a million or maybe even a million dollars when she dies from the life insurance. So she's had a much more tax-efficient plan mm -hmm. and gotten all these benefits up front to convert her Roth with no taxes at all. So there's a lot of cool things yeah. you can do when you know the different rules the and rules. what the tr trusts uh, can do. So how high – we're almost at the end here. How high have taxes been historically? What is – the uh, top tax bracket, put in the comments, what is the top f uh, federal tax bracket we've ever had in this country? Right now it's 37%. Mm -hmm. So what do you think the highest? I see somebody said 50%. 60. Yeah. 75. Or what are we, a communist country? 75%? <laughs> right. No, you're actually, you're close. Yeah. It's 94%. Incredible. That is the highest bracket we've ever had in this country. 94% back during World War II. But even after that, 90% for a while, 70% yeah. for a while. The, the, and what's amazing about this chart too is is when you go back here that even at the the smallest rate, the lowest rate, making only ten thousand, uh, it's over forty percent. So back then, even if you it's had only ten thousand income, you had forty percent tax, which is higher than the highest yeah. rate is today. So you might be in a lower tax bracket someday in the future, but the bracket itself could be significantly higher, and you've got to be aware of that. You know, most people assume that taxes will go up over time. Uh, and, you know, they had to pay for these uh, debts somehow, right? Mm -hmm. Again, insufficient data causes undue stress. We don't want you to be stressed. And how do you release <laughs> stress in retirement? What do you get rid uh, of? Taxes, fees, risk. Taxes, major causes fees, of stress. risk. Yep. If you get rid of risk, fees, and taxes, then you don't have stress in retirement. You have much higher income. And most of our clients actually have about 50 to 60% more income after working with us than they do before. Mm -hmm. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So, planning for legacy. What kind of taxes are there? There's estate taxes, right? So, we mm -hmm. have an exclusion right now for the next couple of years. 13.6 million. So, the next two years is the great time to die because <laughs> you don't you can leave 13 million with no no uh, taxes. Yeah. Now, I don't mean that you actually die, but you pretend that you die for the purposes of estate taxes. So, you can okay. give the money away. And le you legally, legally, it's like you died and gave this money away and you, you don't pay any taxes on it. You can leave up to $13 million. It's going to go down to about $6 million probably in two years. It's definitely going to go down the exact amount. You know, we'll, we'll see what that is, but it's about $6 million. Mm -hmm. If you are above that exclusion when you die, then it's a 40% tax on excess. So it's a huge deal to prepare for this if you're going to be in, in anywhere close to that amount. Gift tax is the same as estate tax. A lot of people think that gift tax is separately. You can only give $18,000 right. a year away. And that just means you can give $18,000 without reporting it. You can give more. I can give you $100,000. I just have to file a gift tax return saying that I've used some of my $13 million, okay. but I still don't pay any tax. And they don't have to pay tax on it. Right. So give, okay. And then if you're going to leave a, a legacy... How do you transfer efficiently? Well, you should have power of attorney. That's more while you're alive so that somebody can take care of your bills if you're incapacitated. Mm -hmm. But then there's wills and trusts. Why should you have a will versus a trust? Well, a trust uh, it actually goes outside probate. A will tells the court what you want to do, but it still goes through probate, and it's public. So all your friends, your neighbors, your enemies, they all mm -hmm. know exactly how much money you had and who it went to. Mm -hmm. And it still can be months or years before your kids inherit that property. A trust can be a lot more smooth, a lot more efficient, and a lot more private. So we recommend strongly that you have a trust, especially if you own real estate. 
And then there's different types of trust. There's irrevocable trust. There's intentionally defective trust. These are more for, and that yeah, that's a real thing, intentionally uh, defective. Intentionally? Okay. Um, these are more for estate planning to save on the estate taxes. And then there's special needs trusts. If you are going to leave money to anybody that is on government benefits for mm -hmm. a special need, they could get kicked off those benefits if they have any assets. So you have to be very careful to leave it in a specific type of trust that prevents it from being counted as part of their assets. Mm -hmm. Then there's Medicaid planning. That's the idea of pretending Spend to give them. all of your money away and be poor so that you qualify for Medicaid for long-term care. I, I don't like that plan so much. Yeah. I'd rather you be wealthy, not poor. And so we want to have other ways to plan for long-term care expenses. Then there's CRUTS. We talked about that. It's a charitable trust to avoid capital gains and get a big tax deduction. Remember that beneficiary designations trump everything. We had a client come in uh, to do, uh, you know, virtually to do a review with us recently, a uh, to try to see if there's any recommendations we would make for them, and we found out that he had gotten divorced about 20 years ago, and half of his uh, 401k went to his ex-wife, and now um, he had forgotten to change the beneficiary. Oh, wow. So when he dies, the other half is going to go to her. So he was very happy to have caught that. He was sure he had changed the beneficiary, but he had not. And even with the best will and trust that ever existed, if the beneficiary says something else, too That's bad. Right. Beneficiary beats everything. Mm -hmm. So make sure your beneficiary matches what you really want to happen. And then wh what kind of assets do you leave? Real estate is great to leave to kids because there's no tax. There's no capital gains tax anyway at death. If you sell it, you pay capital gains. But when you die, there's no capital gains. But don't put more than one child on the deed. We'll tell you that why in a minute. Then there's mutual funds, stocks, bonds, same thing. No tax and no gains tax at death. Inherited IRAs. This is the worst possible yeah. thing to leave to your kids right now. The SECURE Act is a new law that says they cannot stretch it out. They have to pay all the tax within 10 years. The best type of thing to leave to your kids, Roth IRAs, life insurance. These are tax-free. They're very efficient. So what are some of the best things to leave to kids? Why would you say don't leave a paid-off house to your three kids? What's yeah, the wrong with They all look happy. Uh, why not? But one wants to sell it. Yeah. One wants to rent it. One <laughs> wants to move in. And now these are your three kids. So, right. You a little conflict uh, arising. Yeah. So instead, if you have a trust, mm -hmm. you can say, hey, the house must be sold or the yeah. house may not be sold or whatever you want to do. But th don't have the kids all on one day. Right. Then they have to agree before anything gets done. It takes the burden off them. They don't have to make that decision or exactly. fight over that or argue over it. Yeah. So we have some other retirement pitfalls real quick before we wrap up. Market risk, I know we, we've hit it a couple times, risk, fees, fees and, taxes. and taxes. But if you have a big market crash, that's kind of like a giant tax coming out mm -hmm. of your account. Yeah, you got to climb back out of that hole. Long-term care costs, make sure you have a plan for it. It doesn't mean that you have to have insurance, but make sure you know what it's going to cost and how to pay how for to it. Go. And then inflation, mm -hmm. really big, uh, uh, another really big killer in retirement. And we can talk to you one-on-one -on -one about the best ways to handle inflation. Then there's boomerang children. <laughs> they, they're coming back. Yes, they move. <laughs> they go out, then they come back. Yes. Well, we have a solution for boomerang children. There you go. The kids won't move back home if they can't find it. Right. So I sell RVs on the side. So. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, <clears throat> with all that, if you decide, based on what you've seen here, that it's worth having a call with us and clicking the link and scheduling a video call, what is the process? What do we do? Well, we, we first go to stage one. We have four stages. Stage mm -hmm. one is getting to know you, assess your current situation, identify the risks, understand your dreams, where you want to be. And, and Tim, how much does this stage cost? Absolutely nothing. So it's no cost at all. Yeah. So this, click the link, make the appointment. We're not going to charge you anything. We'll just have a 15 to 20 minute call and it, find out what it is that we can help you with. And then if you want, it's optional, you can move to stage two. Stage two is the pre-qualification offer. Remember, with us, without us. Mm -hmm. With us, without us, right? So we give you a tax plan, a risk analysis, a fee analysis, an income plan. We discuss estate planning topics, and then we tell you what it's going to cost for us to implement the plan, but we give you the plan ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And and that's a $6,000 value, but on this uh, webinar, if you click the link and, and make the appointment, it's only a $500 flat fee for people who attended this webinar. Again, you don't pay us now. You just do stage one. Stage one's free and there's no obligation. But if you want to do the pre-qualification offer, we'll give you that for 500 bucks. And we also have a money back guarantee that if you do not find value in it, we'll give mm -hmm. you the money back. 
but you're going to get a lot of value. You right. have it will show you exactly how much we can save you on taxes. Like I said, most people we save over a million dollars in taxes. Uh, most people have significantly less less risk, significantly higher income when they work mm-hmm. with us. And then if you decide that you like that plan and you want to actually have us implement it instead of some other advisor, then you we go to stage three and we talk about products and services and so on. And then we make sometimes very small changes. Mm-hmm. So we don't just upend your entire plan. Sometimes just a little tweak will have a huge impact. Mm-hmm. So we'll talk about that stage three and stage four if you want to move forward at that point. But there's no obligation at any of these uh, uh, stages. Right. We want you to get to the point where you can really say this. With me, without me. With me, without me. With you. <laughs> so again, we, we want you to be able to uh, have a huge impact yeah. you know, on, on your finances to reduce and eliminate risk, fees, fees, and taxes. And we can help you do that. So go ahead and click the link and make the appointment. We'll be happy to talk to you. We are out of time today to answer any questions um, uh, on the seminar, but you can schedule the appointment and we'll be happy to answer all your questions one-on-one in that stage one free video call. Thank you for being on with us. Uh, we look forward to talking with you.